So my name is Julie Whitfield um, and I'm an environmental consultant from Bendigo and I am incredibly passionate about all things flora and fauna and all of our native species. I have been working on my own for about three years as an environmental consultant, but prior to that I was a threatened species officer for the Department of Sustainability and Environment. So that's where a great deal of my knowledge has come from. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the threatened species that could potentially be occurring in this area and what has been recorded in this area and give you a little bit more information about the majority of these species and the things that we can be doing to help them out. Um, this here, oh, that's not worked. Oh, it's a bit slow. This is, as you can see, a map of Victoria. Now, when we think about threatened species, most people tend to think about tigers, uh, rhinos. What a lot of people don't understand is that right here in central Victoria, we actually have some of the rarest species in the world. I am at the moment working on the orchid recovery program for the Lottam Mallee region. And we have species in Bendigo whereby we have only three individual plants left that we know of. So we're talking about things that are very much on the brink of extinction. We're talking about species that my children may never get a chance to see. Um, we're talking about things that your grandchildren will hear stories of but may never get a chance to see. So I think it's integral that we start to think about these things and how we can be helping these species within our revegetation projects, looking after and maintaining our remnant vegetation that we have on our land and, and just in general the sorts of things that we can be thinking about to help share that knowledge about the endangered species of our region. So this map that you're looking at here is a statewide native vegetation map and the green highlighted areas that you can see are the large patches of remnant vegetation that we have left. So across the central Victorian region here, I'm sure everybody's heard the term box iron bark country before. So across this central Victorian strip here, we've actually, since European settlement, we've managed to clear more than 85% of our native vegetation. So we are, we're talking about the very, very last of our native veg in our region. It is, it is integral that people start to think about the fact that that means we have threatened species absolutely everywhere. It doesn't matter where you go, any patch of bush, I can promise you that you're likely to find a threatened species within that patch of bush. And I'm going to talk to you about the different levels of legislation that things are protected under and the different threatened species that you might find in this region or that have been recorded in this region. So as you can see, we have pretty much decimated our native vegetation. We do not have much left at all. And what we do have that's occurring on roadsides, um, small remnant patches on farmland, and then what we have left in our reserve system is the very last fragments of our native vegetation in Victoria. So we really need to start thinking about how we can improve that, enhance it, and make it better. I'm gonna talk in particular about, obviously, the Campaspe catchment. Um, with a focus on the upper reaches of the Campaspe. There's an awful lot of threatened species that have been recorded in the Campaspe catchment. If I was to talk to you about all of them, we would be here all day. So I'm just going to focus on that southern section there, um, what you might find around this area. This is a Google Earth image of this area. And as you can see, there's not really a lot of large patches of native vegetation left. We've got, um, we've got Macedon, we've got the Wombat, um, but really between Castlemaine and where we're standing right now, apart from what's left scattered on farmland, there's not really a lot of native veg left. If you zoom out a little bit, you can see there that what we do have is large patches of forest with all of this stuff in between. And I don't think you can see it very well, but the Campaspe is running up, up here, along there. So what we should be thinking about doing is connecting these large patches of bush together. We've got species, lots of threatened species that are occurring in these large patches. And what we can do as local landholders and land care groups and people who are generally interested in being out and about in the bush, we can actually try and help put their pieces of these patches of bush back together. And that can be done through your roadsides. It can be done through, obviously, the Campaspe. 
enhancing the habitat that is along the Camp Aspie, we can actually create corridors. So I'm sure everybody's been thinking about their corridors, about their, um, their uh, corridors that they're creating through fencing, uh, through their um, fence lines and, and putting in some corridors and shelter belts. So if we start thinking about that on a landscape scale, we can actually start to put things back together. So using our roadside vegetation, that is where the majority of our threatened species um, records have come from for this area. It's from our roadside veg, along the river, and also our scattered paddock trees as well. They, they may not seem like, you know, there's a lot going on there, but you'll actually be surprised with what your paddock trees can actually provide for biodiversity. They're integral for bats, insects, um, and there's a, a common misconception there that mistletoe is actually a bad thing on your trees as well. Um, mistletoe is a great biodiversity asset. Um, a lot of our endangered butterfly species use mistletoe as a host plant. It brings in birds, which means that it also brings in seed because the birds poop the seed everywhere and you're going to get more vegetation growing because you've got mistletoe there. So mistletoe in the landscape is a really good thing. It can, it can attack stressed trees and can seem like it's a, you know, a bad thing to have, but it's actually a wonderful thing because it does bring a lot of insects and birds in. And as I said, most of our endangered species of butterflies in Victoria actually utilise mistletoe as a, a host plant. So mistletoe is good. So um, don't think that you need to be getting rid of it. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit. This is not really about the threatened species as an individual species, but this is talking about habitat and what we actually need in our bushland and in our remnant vegetation in order to provide resources for our woodland species. So um, Deakin University, uh, Professor Jim Radford and Andrew Bennett began a research project in about 2007. And what they wanted to know was how much habitat do we need to provide in the landscape, in a landscape context, in order to bring those woodland dependent species back into the landscape. And I've brought along for everybody, I'm hoping that there'll be enough, but I've brought along a copy of the publication here, which is a really interesting read. So please take one if you'd like to have a look at it. But what this study actually found was that where you've got a landscape with less than 10% vegetation cover, you're not really going to get all that much in there. You're going to find your common species, the species that aren't too particular about their habitat requirements. You're going to have magpies and galahs and crested pigeons in that really highly modified landscape. Your mammals, you're really only going to have things like kangaroos, possums maybe, those really robust things that can, can handle those sorts of conditions. But in general, there's not going to be enough vegetation in a landscape like that to provide your mammals, your birds, your flora as well, with the ability to be viable and sustainable. Whereas in an, a landscape where you have 10 to 15% cover, things are starting to look a little bit better. You know, we're going to start to get some of those woodland birds are going to start to come in. You're going to get Jackie Winters, mistletoe birds, some of the robins, some of the honey eaters, maybe some of the more aggressive honey eaters, but you'll still get those things in there and you'll start to see other things in terms of mammals coming in, echidnas and those sorts. Um, so, you know, that's looking much better. 10 to 15% cover is looking much, much better. But ideally what we want to see is about a 30% cover in our vegetation. So this can be achieved in a landscape through roadside corridors, through borders, boundary fencing corridors, through river systems. So if we can try and create something like this in the landscape, then what we are going to see is that some of those woodland dependent species will start to come back into the landscape. Not only will they come back in, but they'll also find that they can move through the landscape from one large patch of forest to another. And then you'll start to get these species talking to each other and genetically the populations will become more viable and we won't see a drop and a decline in our species. So I don't think that 30% cover is too hard to achieve if we get out there and we start working really hard at it. Um, just get out and do it. Plant things, grow things, start thinking about what it is we want to see in the landscape. And I know everybody loves it. Do we have birdos in the room? I'm sure we do. There's always birdos in the room. Um, yeah, put your hand up if you like birds. 
There we go. Everybody loves birds. So, you know, if we want to see things like crested bellbirds in our landscape, if we want to see some of the amazing robins, hooded robins, red cat robins, scarlet robins, we need to have more vegetation in our land. So 30% cover, obviously, ideally, I'd be asking for 80, but um, I still need to eat, I guess, so, you know. Um, but yeah, a 30, 30 plus percent cover is really what we're after. So how does this impact on our threatened species? Without these corridors, without the ability for our things to distribute through the landscape, then what we have is genetic bottlenecking in some of our smaller reserves. So as I said, I work on a, a plant species at the moment whereby I have three individuals. So genetically, they're in a little bit of trouble. You need a few more than three of something to be able to keep it sustained well into the future. So we need to be able to let these things talk to one another genetically through the landscape. We need the ability for these things to move. It's great that we have got big patches of bush. The Wombat State Forest is phenomenal. One of my favourite spots to go. Absolutely gorgeous. Castle Maine has got some beautiful vegetation too. You've got Mount Macedon. These are beautiful places to go. But unless the species from within each of these reserves can talk to each other, we're going to see rapid decline over the years. And there will be mass extinction take place across all of Australia if we don't start building these things back together. We need to create stepping stones for these species. So how many people, how many local landholders do we have in the room? Yep, quite a few. Um, with large scale farms? No? Anyone with large areas of remnant vegetation on their blocks? Yep. How large is large? Five hectares, plus, yep. Plus the stream. Plus the stream, yep. yep. Um, do we have anyone who's living adjoining a large patch of bush? No? Yes? Yep, you're adjoining, that's good. Good, good. So what we can do is we can start to build these pieces back together. And that's what I want to encourage people to think about today. When you are doing reveg, don't just think about the things that you would be planting locally for just the indigenous stuff. But think about the stuff that might be occurring locally that is actually rare. Start thinking about incorporating rare species into your revegetation projects. It doesn't have to be too hard. There are certain things that are actually quite easy to grow. There's um, some wallaby grasses that grow around your dam. Very, very easy to grow. So why not give it a shot? The only thing that I recommend you be aware of is that certain species are listed. Um, under different types of legislation, so you need to be aware of that. You can't just go out into the bush and collect seed off an EPBC listed species without there being some consequences. So get to know the species for your area. Find out which ones will be easy to grow. There's a lot of local nurseries that would be more than happy to support you putting endangered species back in in your reveg projects. Um, and some of them are really simple. Some of them you could probably even attempt to grow yourself if you've got a green thumb. So. Include them in your reveg. So, I did a little bit of research to see what you would actually have here. So, has anybody heard of the ALA or the Atlas of Living Australia? Yep, so that's pretty much what it is. It's a database that stores all of the information about all of the species that we have in Australia. So, you can use this system yourself. So, if you're wanting to find out what you've got on your property or within your area, you can get onto the Atlas of Living Australia's website and you can work your way through some maps and some processes and you can pull out a list of what has actually been recorded. Um, and also using the VBA or the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas. Has anybody heard of this one? Yep. So the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas is um, the database of which the state government uses and it stores all of the flora and fauna information on it. So you can also get access to that. And the bonus about these two databases is not only that you can pull information off so that you can educate yourself about what's there, but you can actually sign up and you can then feed information back into these systems, which is really important because it's the people on the ground that know where things are that feed this information into these systems. So you can join up with the Atlas of Living Australia or the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas. And if you've got something that is rare in your area, you can put that information in there. And then that information gets used by the museum, by the government, um, and by, by generally other people who want to know what's, what's been found locally. 
and you can actually share that information. So without knowing what's where, there's no way we can actually manage these species properly. So I, I recommend that if you're interested, join up with these websites and find out what you've got locally and start feeding back your own information as well. And if anybody, do we have photographers in the room? People who love to take pictures? Yeah, oh, definitely the cameraman up the back. But um, there's also another uh, database that you can use that's run from the Museum of Victoria and it's called Bowerbird. So if you like to take photographs of things, insects, bugs, fungi, whatever, you can upload your photos onto Bowerbird and then these photos are actually assessed and looked at by a whole suite of um, entomologists and lepidopterists and botanists and you know the people that work at the museum pretty much. And they can look at your photos, they can give you an identification on it. But the other, other bonus is if you give a location, that information goes into the museum and it will be stored there in time and space forever. So we can have a very good understanding of what is where. And that's one of the things that I've noticed through the work that I've done over the last eight to ten years is that there are a lot of loopholes and there are a lot of blank spots where there's missing information. So it's the people on the ground taking the walk in the Wombat State Forest on a Saturday morning or out checking on their crops or their stock and seeing things on the ground that can feed that information back into these systems so that we know what is where and when it was there. And that's really important information because we're losing things at an alarming rate. We need that information stored somewhere. It's no good just having it up here or in some little notes. It needs to be somewhere where people will be able to use it forever. So what do we have? We've got recorded, as you can see there, I've put a little polygon around just the section of the reaches that I wanted to look at. As I said, I wasn't going to do the whole campaspy or I'd be here probably for two days talking to you about species that you've got. But on the ALA and the VBA, I came up with seven amphibians recorded, which I reckon there's probably more. It's just that there hasn't been somebody put that information into the system. We've got 25 mammals, which I was quite impressed. I didn't think there'd be that many. That obviously is including pests as well. Um, six reptiles, 145 birds. So for all your birdos there, does anybody have 145 on their list, on their tick sheet yet? Getting close to 100, good stuff. Um, and then vascular plants, you've got 455 and that's including weeds. So a large portion of those is probably going to be weeds in this landscape, but that's still quite impressive. So when we're talking about, you know, you've got quite a lot of species recorded in just that little section. I think in total, if you incorporate it into that fungi um, and invertebrates as well, it was something like 750 species for that little section there. Um, a large portion of those are actually endangered, and I'll talk to you about those ones in a minute. But what I wanted to inform you of was the different levels of protection that we have for our threatened species in Victoria. So we have the EPBC Act, which has anybody heard of the EPBC Act before? Yep. This is our federal legislation <coughs> that protects things on a national level. So if something is listed under the EPBC Act, that means if you want to do anything that involves any work on that species, then you actually have to get approval by the federal government to do so. Um, and you don't have all that many EPBC listed species in this, in this region. Uh, then we have the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act, which is our Victorian state legislation that protects our endangered species. And then we have something called the VROT list, which is the Victorian Rare or Threatened List of Species. Now this list is a list that's been generated by the state government that sort of states that we recognise that these things are rare and they're endangered and they're at risk of becoming <coughs> extinct, but they haven't yet gone through the processes of being listed under the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act or being listed under the EPBC Act. So it's sort of recognising that we need to do something about these things but there's not really a great deal of legislative power there to protect them. So nationally, in this, in this area, as you saw on the polygon there, that's where I've pulled this information from. Um, nationally, oh, on our, our national list, we actually have one mammal species that's been recorded in the area, which is a spot-tailed quoll. Has anybody ever seen a quoll? Pardon? In Tassie? Yeah, yeah. So these guys have actually been recorded in the Wombat State Forest just recently, um, which is really 
really exciting. It's very exciting. We've had some records um, for some other areas before, out Lockwood Way, um, but this is, this is really exciting because in, in the natural environment, when you have your top predators that are being, being um, recorded, it means that there's a whole heap of other stuff going on there that, that means that they're there and they're sustainable. So obviously, you know, your spot-tailed quoll's not going to be there if your populations of other things weren't high and healthy. So it's a really good thing to have this guy recorded. Um, so he's listed federally. So of the 145 birds that were recorded within that polygon area, we've got one that's been recorded that's listed federally, which is the swift parrot. Has anybody ever seen a swift parrot before? Yep, you all have. There's one just here. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's pretty stuffed. This guy's about as endangered as you can get. Um, so this is a swift parrot here. Sweet little bird. Um, what's really sad about this guy is in the time that I've been working with threatened species, which has only been eight years, this species has declined by 50%. So when I first started working on threatened species, there were 800 breeding pairs of swift parrots left in the wild, and now we're down to about 1,000. So this guy is listed um, as endangered under the EPBC Act, but he's about to be upgraded to critically endangered. So this might be one of those species that I was saying my grandchildren might not get to see. The amazing thing about these guys is that they actually, they breed in Tasmania, in the beautiful blue gum forests in Tassie, and so there is a mark against their name already because their blue gum forests in Tasmania are getting cleared at an alarming rate. So their breeding habitat is being lost. The amazing thing about them is that they fly across to the mainland every year, and they fly up the coast, and they overwinter in the warmer areas, sort of New South Wales and Queensland. And then they migrate back down to Tasmania for the breeding season. So if you're interested in learning more about these guys, you can get onto the um, BirdLife Australia website. And we have uh, swift parrot surveys that take place a couple of times a year. You can get involved in doing that. You can pick a particular patch of bush and go out and do a survey learn the methodologies and be involved in conservation for these guys. These guys require um, nectar for feeding on um, and they call, they're called swift parrots because that's exactly what they are, incredibly fast, um, incredibly swift and they move through the landscape in a very fast manner and they just feed and move and feed and move and they need their habitat to be where it was the year before, and the year before that, and the year before that. And they, they need to be able to move through the landscape. As I was saying, they need that connectivity to be able to move through the landscape so that they can do what they are ecologically and biologically required to do. So, you know, large old paddock trees, remnant veg on roadsides, it's, it's essential for this species here. And like I said, 50% decline in the small amount of time that I've been working on threatened species. I don't know that, you know, that's only eight years. And 50% decline is pretty sad. Now that eight years, does that mean there's not going to be any left? We need to help them out as much as we can. Um, growling grass frog, I'm sure everybody's heard about growling grass frogs. Yep. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that one. The CMA's website has got amazing resources on frogs. They've got fact sheets on all the frogs for the region. And if you are interested more in frogs, one of the things that um, makes these guys pretty easy is that you can identify them by call. So the Frogs of Victoria website has all of the frog calls. You can get on, you can do a little bit of a map search, get a list of what frog species are in your area, learn their calls, and you'll know what you've got. You very rarely get a chance to see them unless you go searching for them and then that can damage their habitat. But you don't need to see them because you know what's there by their call. So familiarise yourself with their calls. So they're our EPBC listed fauna species that we have in the area. I didn't mention um, an invert there. I'm not going to go too much into invertebrates because there's a lot of them. It's about 4,000 species of moths in Victoria. There's um, 600 plus butterflies in Australia. So I'm not going to go into the the insects, but there is also the golden sun moth, which I'm sure people have heard about, um, has been recorded in the area. That's also an EPBC listed species um, and can be found in one of these books over here. But there's also fact sheets available for sun moths on the 
DALP website if you're interested. Um, and then we have our vascular plants and we have three EPBC listed plants in the region. So this is just the nationally listed species. So these are just the ones that are listed under the federal legislation. So we have the clover glycine down the bottom there on the left hand corner. Um, this is actually probably a very easy species to propagate. Um, and so, you know, if you go through the right processes, you could be putting this one back out into your re-veg re projects as well. The one in the middle there is a, called Ornate Fingers. It's a little Caledonia species. Don't even go there. Do not try and put that one back into your re-veg projects because orchids are incredibly complex species. Um, and in order to grow them, you also need to do things like learn about their mycorrhizal association with fungus in the soil, and you need to be able to grow them up. And some of the orchids that I've been growing up to re plant back out into the wild. Some of those species have taken us 15 to 20 years to figure out how to grow them. So orchids are a long way off going back into re-veg projects, but one day, one day we'll get there. Um, and then you've got the matted flax lily, um, Dianella amina, which is pretty common on a lot of the roadsides in this area, um, roadsides and sort of more open woodland type habitat. Um, the amazing thing about uh, Dianellas and just bringing bit of insect information in there is that these guys are actually buzz pollinated. Has anybody ever heard that term before? Yep. What happens is these are pollinated by a native bee, usually blue banded bee. Um, and the bee actually buzzes at a particular decibel, which the vibrations of that will actually make the flower open up and release its pollen. So it's amazing. So it won't get pollinated by anything but the bee. And these sorts of interactions are taking place with everything, everything in the wild. You know, as I said, the orchids, we can't grow those until we first figure out what mycorrhizal fungi in the soil is responsible for germinating the seed. They also have specific pollinators. So there are particular orchid species that are only pollinated by a single species of wasp. It's quite phenomenal. These relationships are happening everywhere right under our noses. That's why it's important as a whole to have large patches of vegetation available for these amazing relationships to take place. And that's why it's essential that we have connection from one large patch to another large patch so that genetically things can be talking and things have the opportunity to move through the landscape. It is essential. Um, so that's our EPBC listed species. I'm not going to go into fish. I think CMA should cover off on that sometime, probably run a fishy workshop or something. Um, but we do have, there's I think two fish species recorded that are EPBC listed in the area as well. So after we've looked at things that are listed federally um, and what, you know, on a national level have been recognised as being incredibly rare and endangered, we've got the FFG list, the Flora and Fauna Guarantee list which is the species that may occur in other places but have been recognised on a state level as being endangered. Now, you see the numbers start to increase. So, including the EPBC listed species that I've just talked about, of the mammals, we've got two listed FFG listed species and that now brings the brush-tailed Fascigale into the mix. Has anybody seen a Fascigale before? No, you have? There's one just here. This here is a brush-tailed fascigale. They're a nocturnal creature. They feed um, mostly on insects. They'll also eat birds' eggs um, and small critters. Um, these guys are amazing. They actually only live for about 12 to 18 months. And what happens is that the females live for a little bit longer than the males. Um, and once the males have reached sexual maturity, they run around frantically through the landscape, doing nothing but mating. They mate so hard and so fast that they die. So they just go. They just go hard for a few weeks and that's it. It's all over for them and they cark it. And then the females live for a little bit longer so that they can raise their young. Um, these guys aren't the only ones that do that. The antichinus also does that. Goes crazy, crazy mating and then just drops dead from exhaustion. Um, sounds like an okay life, but they only live for about 18 months. So, you know, what that means is that in the landscape, they need to have everything available for them. They need to feed 
quick and fast before the mating season. They need to build up their energy resources because they're not worrying about feeding too much while they're frantically mating all over the place. They need to have their resources available. What they need more importantly, again, is that connectivity in the landscape. So they, you, know, you may have half a dozen males in an area, large patch of bush. Um, they're leaving pheromones all over the landscape. All over the landscape, they're leaving their scent. When they're ready to mate and they, they reach sexual maturity, they're following those pheromones across the landscape and they're looking for their females to mate with. So they need to have large patches of bush to live in, but they also need to have their corridors for connectivity from one patch to the other. So that again, genetically, these things can be talking to each other. But what they also need is habitat for their food sources. So they need to have native grasses. They don't eat native grasses, but you will find lots of spiders on native grasses, and spiders is one of their favourite foods. So you need to have um, logs on the ground. Don't be clearing up your logs. Um, you know, the, the logs in your paddocks are essential because that is habitat for things. That's habitat for things like striped legless lizards, um, for resources and food resources for a lot of these little mammals and marsupials that are crawling around all over the place. They like to scurry along and dig up under things and that's what they need. They need their habitat to be available for them so they can pers persist in the landscape. Um, then we also have uh, nine birds have been added to, added to our list. Go over here. Um, no reptiles listed, but I think that that's probably because none have been recorded on any of these databases. So if you're interested in reptiles, get out and start looking. Take photos, um, learn about them, and I'm pretty certain that you probably would have somewhere around here, you may have striped legless lizards. Um, you've prob well, not probably, I reckon you've definitely got olive legless lizards. There's a lot of things out here um, that that probably have not actually been recorded yet. So start looking for them. And like I said, it's good to have it up here and to know what you've got, but you need to put that information somewhere or tell somebody about it who can put that information somewhere so that it can be stored eternally. Um, so, and then our amphibians, we've got the Bibrin's toadlet is added to that list. Does anybody know the Bibrin's toadlet or the brown, brown toadlet? Okay, it's a cute, tiny little frog tiny, tiny little frog, lays its um, eggs in the leaf litter around maybe near dams. doesn't necessarily need to be in a dam, but it likes to have bushland, so large areas of bushland. Um, you can find that information on, as I said, the CMA's website. They have frog fact sheets and also the frogs of Victoria website. You'll be able to get the call um, because, again, the best way to find out what frogs you've got is to listen and learn their calls for identification. Um, now added to our list, we've got six um, FFG listed plant species as well. So added to the other species we had, we've got the black gum. Does anybody know black gum? Yep, you've got them on your block. The old plant oh, Fantastic, very good. And that's the best thing you could probably do for this species um, is plant them. <laughs> we need more of them. And one of the biggest problems for this species, so this is Eucalyptus aggregata, and the biggest problem for this species is that where we do have stands of large old trees, there's actually no recruitment taking place underneath them. And that's obviously got something to do with nitrogen, nutrient levels in the soil, stock, um, and we just need to start collecting the seed. Collect the seed from the black gum, send it to your local nurseries, have the plants grown up and plant them back out. It's probably the best thing that we can be doing for this species. Um, and we have also recorded the Castlemaine spider orchid has just jumped in there as well. Um, this is Caledonia clavescens. This is a species that I've done some reintroductions for in the past and I'm about to do some more. But again, like I said, it's an orchid. It's not really one that can be incorporated into reveg projects just yet. These, um, when you're doing orchid re or reintroductions, we call them, um, you really need to be looking at having ideal habitat because there's a lot of other factors that come into play. Um, and then we've got the um, Australian anchor plant as well, which is also a listed species, FFG listed species for the region. Um, and these are the bird species that we've just added, uh, FFG listed bird species. And I'm sure people have seen some of those. Obviously the Eastern Great Egret there, top left hand corner, that's 
going to be found around, da around your dams um, uh, and where you've got some good areas in your waterways, um, feeding on amphibians and crustaceans. Um, then we've got the painted honey eater, which is the one on the top right there. This is a very old record, um, but it is a species that has been recorded in the area. It's a very rare species. I've been watching birds for a long time and I've never seen one. Have any of the birdos in the room seen one of these before? Nope. Um, yeah, I've never seen one myself. So they are very, very rare in the landscape. But it's a species that you could be thinking about when you're planting your native veg, excuse me. Um, what are its habitat requirements? What could we be putting back into the landscape for this species? Then we've got our three listed owls down there, in the bottom left hand corner. Um, everybody would be familiar with the powerful owl would have either heard it, um, would know of it. Um, this is a very big owl, stands about this tall. Beautiful creature, absolutely beautiful creature. The thing about this species is they have a huge home range, huge range that they need. And they need their food resources as well. So they feed mostly on possums. So in order to have their food, you need to have good possum habitat and you need to have good populations of possums. And in order to do that again, it comes back to needing that connectivity between one, from one patch of bush to another. It is integral in, in these ecosystems to be able to keep things working and moving the way that we need them to. We must have that connection between our large patches of bush. Um, then we have the barking owl. Um, looks quite similar, but less than half the size, I think. Um, and we have also the masked owl. Um, and for those who are interested in learning about your bird species, maybe not, ev not everybody has smartphones, but in today's society, we have this amazing technological age. And I got one of these smartphones myself just so that I could get this app, which is um, a bird app. So this, this has all of the bird species in Australia on it. It has all their calls, their distributions, information, photographs of eggs, etc. Um, so I don't, I don't like mobile phones myself, but I got a mobile phone so that I could have a bird field guide on it. Um, so this is, if anyone's interested, I'll, I'm happy to show you this application. It's, um, it's great. As I said, it has the bird calls on it. So I could go through this right now and I could tell you, what have I got here? Oh, I was just gonna do this one. which everybody's probably, is that going to work? That's a barking owl. So there are, there are apps that you can get for your phones that will help you to educate yourself about what's actually in your area. Um, I was <laughs> they, they, they can be dangerous too. I was actually out with some ecologists one day doing some surveys and they were doing a bird list and I was showing someone my app and um, we got back to talk about what was actually found and they had a whole heap of things recorded that weren't in the area and then I realised it was because we were actually playing around with apps that they thought that they were hearing things like Regent honey eaters and the like. So be careful, you know, don't be trying to trick people with them but um, they're a brilliant thing. And there's also one that you can download for free from the Museum of Victoria's website. So I guess what I'm trying to get across there is that there is information out there. So Today, there are no excuses. Everybody has the ability to learn. There are field guides on everything that you might find. I found a field guide in the museum the other day on bacteria. I didn't buy it. I didn't even think about it, but there are, there are field guides on absolutely everything. There's information there for you to educate yourself with. So um, after the speckled warbler, we've got the grey goshawk um, and We've got, oh sorry, the speckled warbler is this little guy here. It's a woodland dependent species, so you need to have, like we said earlier, more than 30% habitat to see this beautiful little bird in your patches of bush. Um, and then we've also got the blue-billed duck, which is just over here. So these are all state listed species that have been recorded right here in this area. So start keeping your eyes open, start taking down lists, get out with your binoculars and start learning about the things in the area. 
So then after our FFG list, we've got our advisory list that I mentioned before, which is the list of species that the state government recognises are rare, threatened, and probably need some more investigation and potentially, probably the way that I see it, some of these, well not some of them, probably all of these species are actually going to be FFG listed or EPBC listed within the next 20 years. These things that I'm talking about today, some of them are on the brink of extinction. Like I said, we've got less than 15% of our native vegetation left in the environment through central Victoria. These things are just holding on. We really need to do what we can to help bring back their habitat, help restore their homes so that they can persist and they can live in this landscape with us. I want to be able to go out in the bush and see these things, and I'm sure that everybody else wants to too, but it's been humans that have caused the damage over the last 150 to 200 years, we need to start thinking about fixing what we've done. So this is our, F our VROT list. Um, we've got three mammal species listed <coughs> under the Victorian Rare or Threatened Species list. 19 bird species now. We've got still no reptiles. That's because pretty much we haven't got many reptiles documented in this area. We've got two amphibians and now we've got 31 plants that are listed as rare, endangered or threatened within this local area. So that there, I'm not going to go through all of them, but that is a list of all of the mammals um, and avian fauna and amphibians that we have listed for this region alone. So that's it's a little bit scary, really, when you think about it. I took a tiny little section off a map, tiny, tiny little section. I don't know what area that covered, but it wasn't pretty big. Um, and that's the list of endangered species that I've pulled out. That's really quite scary when you think about it. You take Victoria, there's something like 1,886 endangered flora species in Vic. 50% of those are orchids, which is pretty scary too. And that's why orchids get an awful lot of my attention. It's not just because they're really good looking plants. Um, and then we have our plant species list as well. So these are species that the Victorian government is saying, we recognise that these are rare and threatened. Doesn't necessarily mean that something's being done about that, but it does mean that they're recognising that. And I think that that's where we come into play. And we have to recognise that we have a responsibility to these things. We are the stewards for our land. We are responsible for what has happened in the past, regardless of whether or not we want to think so but we also need to be responsible and take action to make sure that these things don't become extinct in our time frame. And as I said, we're talking about, you know, 15% of our native vegetation left across Central Vic. That's happened in a very short time frame, very, very short time frame. What is going to happen when we actually realise what the lag time of that impact has been? You know, we, we've done some serious damage in even just the last 50 to 100 years. Those species that are still hanging on in the landscape haven't caught up to the damage that we've done yet. They are still trying to figure out how to get from one patch of bush to another. Genetically, we could be having some serious impacts. If these things can't talk to each other from one patch of bush to another, we're going to get genetic bottlenecking happening. We're going to get inbreeding depression and we are going to lose things. We are, well we are, not we are going to, we are losing things very, very quickly and in a very short time frame. And I personally don't want a world of just galahs and magpies. I don't want that. I like them. Galahs are great. I love the way they fly. They're one of my favourite birds. But I want to see hooded robins. I want to see speckled warblers. I want to hear, and don't see them very often, but I want to hear swift parrots fly by. I want to know that they're there just because I want to know that I've helped to do something to make sure they've persisted because we have done an awful lot of damage and we really need to think about how we can fix that and think about moving forward. And that is through our revegetation, maintaining the integrity of our river systems and keeping things in as best condition as we possibly can. And no more removal pretty much is what it comes down to for me. No more native veg removal is what we need. We need to be holding on to what is left. We need to be increasing the amount of vegetation that we have in the landscape because there is nowhere for these things to go once the, that's been removed. 
So we need to hold on to what is left and make it better. I'm going to talk just a little bit about insects. As I said, I won't, won't go on about insects because you could talk about them for days on end. Each thing, you know, Coleoptera, we could talk about beetles for a day. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to talk about why they're important in the ecosystem. You know, they're not just pests, mozzies buzzing in your face or whatever. We need insects. Without them, we're all stuffed. Excuse my French. We are in trouble without our insects. They are integral in the ecosystems. They are responsible for our nutrient cycling, for soil conditioning and aeration. And the estimated value of insects across the world is about $3 trillion per annum. I don't know how they came up with that estimate, but that's what they're telling us. We need, I don't know if anybody's ever done any kind of soil science, but if you took one teaspoon of soil, there's in that soil alone, there's like a million bacteria or, or organisms. So I think it's for every human being, there's something like 200,000 inverts available. So that's, that's a few, quite a few. Um, but pollination, without our insects, we wouldn't have any food. We'd have nothing. You know, people have heard about what's happening in America with the loss of their bees. Yep, that's going to come here soon. We, we're going to have to deal with the varroa mite here in Australia, and it is going to mean a serious reduction in the pollination of our food crops. So we really need to understand that our insects keep us alive. They keep the planet running. Without them, we're all in trouble. So 80% of our flowering plants are actually insect pollinated. There's a few grasses that are wind distributed, their pollen is you know, blown off in the breeze, but we need our insects for pollination. And as I said before, some orchid species, for example, are pollinated by a particular species of wasp. One species of orchid for one species of wasp. And that relationship goes even further in that that species of wasp is a parasitic wasp and parasitizes only one particular species of beetle larva. So we need to be maintaining as much of our veg as we possibly can so that those relationships continue to take place. Population control is also another big factor that in insects play. We all know that, um, that we need ladybirds to eat our aphids. So if we want our roses, we need our ladybirds because the, the aphids are going to destroy our plants. So there's, there's all these things that are taking place and insects are controlling other populations of other insects. They're controlling other populations of, of mammals. They're controlling our aquatic fauna as well. So we have, a, we have a, a responsibility to make sure that we can keep our insects on the planet. And, and food. Um, without insects, there'd be no birds. Without insects, there'd be nothing really. It's pretty much what it comes down to. Um, everybody who knows anything about bats knows that um, moths take up 80% of a bat's diet. Um, there are about 4,000 species of uh, moths in Victoria that have been recorded, that have been identified. There's probably another 4,000 species of moths sitting in the museum that no taxonomist has touched yet. They'll get to it one day, I'm sure. Um, and then there's probably that again of species that haven't actually been caught or identified or recorded somewhere. So we have species out there that still haven't even been discovered. So why is that important to us? You know, that, that's important in the natural ecosystem. That's important out there in the wild. We see that that's all part of the, the function of the ecosystem. But why is that important to us? As I said, nutrient cycling, um, and our soil, uh, aeration, etc. Insects are essential for all of those things. Agriculture, it's estimated that $120 billion a year um, is the responsibility of our pollinators. So imagine not having the bees that we use to pollinate our solanums or our tomatoes. Um, we would have to, and we have started having to, we have to pay people to go around with little brushes and pollinate our tomato crops. Um, there's been some research happening at the moment into uh, native blue-banded bees being used for pollinating tomatoes, but that hasn't been successful. So we need our insects. And then there's a whole heap of other stuff, you know, our honeybees, um, which are not native, and in the natural environment, they're actually quite 
devastating the things that they do but they're also responsible for pollinating a lot of our food crops so there's a bit of a balance that we need to have there um, in the US honeybees are responsible for pollinating and, and providing 14 billion dollars worth of service to the Americans so they need their honeybees and they're losing them so I don't know what they're going to do once they've lost all their bees um, then there's commercial products that come from insects as well um, varnish is actually a scale insect which is really interesting I didn't know that um, like a little mollusky type thing um, obviously we have honey beeswax cotton silk all those sorts of things and the aesthetics of it you know who doesn't love dragonflies and damselflies and you know I just keep thinking to myself when I'm trying to encourage people to be more interested in learning about these things is imagine a world with a world without butterflies it's just wouldn't be a very nice place I don't think without the bees the birds and the butterflies this here this this quote by David Attenborough is probably gonna just throw it right in your faces and he says in my favorite TV show life in the undergrowth he says that if we and the rest of the backboned animals were to disappear overnight the rest of the world would get on fine but if they were to disappear overnight this is in reference to invertebrates obviously the land's ecosystems would collapse for the fact is that they were the pioneers they were the first animals of any kind to colonize the lands of the earth without our invertebrates we don't exist we need our insects to keep all of our ecosystems functioning that means aquatic inverts as well and terrestrial without our insects we are all in a lot of trouble so we need to think about that too planting out our corridors our river systems more vegetation means that we're increasing the habitat for our insects and invertebrates. We need them. Without them, we're all buggered. So what can you do? You know, I'm, I'm sure as local landholders, most of you are members of land care groups, etc. So I don't really need to tell you too much what you can do. All I can tell you is that you need to do it. You know, you, you hear it all the time. Plant out your... your um, increase the size of your corridors I'm not sure do, do people have corridors that they're trying to create yep make them bigger I'm gonna get really really greedy and I'm gonna say a 10 meter strip it's not enough a 20 meter strip not enough like I said before when you're looking at those percentages in the landscape of, of um, habitat that you need a 10 meter strips not gonna cut it I'm asking you to give a hundred you have 100 metres. If you want to see these things in your paddocks, in your bushland reserves, you need to give them their homes. The insects won't be moving through the landscape without stepping stones. The Fasca gales aren't going to go anywhere unless they've got large old trees, they've got good shrub layers, good grass layers, but they don't just need a 10 metre strip of it because when you've got a 10 metre strip, you've got weeds coming in as well. You've got all these other factors that are going to have an influence over that. You need 100 metres, 50 to 100 metres minimum. So I'm just going to ask you to give back a little bit more, just a little bit. It doesn't have to be much. It might, over a large area, it might seem like a large amount. But if you want those things, you want the speckled warblers moving through the landscape. If we don't want to be responsible for the loss of our hooded robins and the loss of our insects, then we need to just give a little bit more. So that is what I'm, I'm asking of people today. Plant more trees, but not just trees, grasses, herbs, everything. Get it all back out there and more area because we've lost so much. We need to put so much more back. Um, and obviously your waterways. You, I'm not going to preach you guys all know what needs to be done. I'm just saying get out there and do it. So let's think about turning images like this into something like this, where you're actually providing resources for these things. Give these things back what they need. You need to have overhanging vegetation on your stream sides. You need to have trees in the area to bring birds in so that you can get movement and dispersal of plants. But um, you guys know all of this and you've got an amazing resource available too. The CMA are the experts on this, and so you can get the information that you need from them about how to do this. If you've got property that is adjoining the Campaspe or any of the other Anna branches, any of the upper reaches in the Campaspe region, the Colibin or whatever, then you can do this on your own properties. It may take a little bit of time and it will take a lot of effort, 
but it will be rewarding when you're seeing things moving through your landscape. Start taking lists of what you've got on your properties now. Start making changes and watch those changes be fruitful. Watch the things move through your property after you've increased their habitat. So start thinking about what you want to see and make the accommodations for those things. If you want speckled warblers, well, you need a bit more habitat. If you want to see hooded robins, think about the things that you need to have for those species. Start targeting your reveg around the things that you would like to see on your properties. And trust me, it will happen. It does happen. And it can happen in a short time frame too, as long as you get out there, you get active, and you start putting it out there. <coughs>